I want to move on now to our keynote speaker in the area of grass ecology. He'll be talking about biodiversity and ecosystem functioning under climate change in alpine grasslands. Dr. Xi Jing He um, got his master's and his PhD, his PhD from the Institute of Botany um, at the Chinese Academy of Sciences. He went on to Harvard University where he, he got his postdoc and then joined Peking University in 2002. Since 2018, he has been the director of the State Key Laboratory of Grassland Agro Ecosystem of Lanzhou University, and he is currently the State Key um, Laboratory of Herb at the State Key Laboratory of Herbage Improvement and Grassland Ecosystem. Published over 200 articles in referee journals. I'm highly cited. Privileged to have him talking with us today. Yes, Dr. E. Thank you very much, Dr. Ray Smith. Uh, it's a great honor to have talk here, and it's also very great to follow, just follow Richard Baguette's talk. Uh, he's a well, highly uh, esteemed scientist. So today, I will talk about uh, the same uh, theme, biodiversity and the ecosystem functioning and the climate change in alpine grassland, particularly in the Tibetan the plateau. Mm -hmm. So, sorry. This, this one? Yes. Oh. oh, yeah. Yeah. So, thanks for the organizer. Before this Congress, we take a Central Grassland Pre-Congress Tour. So this is a great the travel. We travel from the south, from the south coast grassland to the middle Texas, and to the uh, Oklahoma, and to the border of Oklahoma of Kansas. So we visit several ranches, King Ranch, Hellington Ranch, Medsovia, Chuck Coffee, USDA, Greenland Research Station, and they also McVean Club Ring Station. So this is a great. I have not been to the west of Missouri and the east of the Rocky Mountain. It's a great chance to have this kind of visit to the grassland. So the, this is the South Great Plains Tall Grass Prairie. Actually, it's about 350 meters above sea level. You know, it's uh, uh, space rich, and uh, also there's some common space. It's common genus with the alpine grassland. We even find the sleeper, the same genus. Sorry. We also visit the central plains. The tall grass prairie. That's about uh, 500 meters, and uh, there's a uh, mixed uh, species. It's it's a very, you know it's a very different from Chinese grassland. It's all the grasses. Most of grasses are C4 plants. It's you know for our grassland they all most uh, C3 the, the plants. So this is my uh, study site, mostly in the Chinese grassland. For the Chinese grassland, we have the temple, temple in the Mongolia grassland. This is just uh, about uh, 1,500 meters above sea level. Also the Tibetan plateau, this, uh, this very high altitude, about uh, 4,000 uh, over 4,000 uh, meters above sea level. But it is also the the area is very very large, and the, the grassland their value the, lies in the vastness of this grassland. The the areas really matters. So we also have the uh, 
the some grassland in the mountain area of Xinjiang province. That's northwest China. So we have mainly three different uh, uh, types of the grassland. It's very different from central central uh, plains because all this grassland is natural vegetation. It's not just like uh, they can't be just a succession to to trees to shrubs. It's natural grassland. This is a landscape, like landscape of Tibetan open grassland. There you see the grass is very short. And uh, the average elevation is about uh, 4,000 meters. That's about uh, 13,000 feet above sea level. It's a very extreme environment. At the same time, you know, this, because of their altitude, it's a low latitude uh, permafrost. So they, it's all around, they have the permafrost, the whole seasonal permafrost. And, uh, and this permafrost is important for the carbon storage. And also it's very sensitive to the climate change. This grassland is the home to the local peoples, to the, particularly to the Tibetan, local Tibetan native, natives. And then their religion is Tibetan Buddhism. And this Tibetan Buddhism, they just reverse mountains, rivers, and gods. They just treat this grass, the mountains, rivers, and the grassland very well. So, and this is a specific rich open grassland. And uh, you know, some grassland is very diverse, just like uh, it depends on the altitude. For, from 3,000 to 200 meters, uh, this alpine grassland, is, uh, we call this step. It's a very species rich, about uh, 15 to 40 species per square meter. But also, at a high altitude, it's about uh, 4,500 meters. This, uh, this we call this uh, alpine step. It's a, a little bit dry. So the, the species is not just diverse, but still there's a, a, a several dominant species, about uh, 10 species per square meters. Uh, this al alpine grassland is the home for wild uh, and domestic uh, animals for the left Picture you see that it's a Tibetan antelope. For the right, it's a Tibetan sheep. So this is domestic this animals. When I prepare this talk, I read the one book. This is Politics of Skill, uh, History of Rangeland Science. It's written by Nathan Sear. So it's very strange. I from this book, for the Great Plains, it's from 1873 to 1893, between the two economic depressions, there's, a, there's a widespread severe overgrazing. Yeah, this overgrazing just because of the capital flow, the investment for the profit of big comp companies from the east to the west United States. And also the severe drought killed thousands of cattle in the Great Plains in the 1890s. And it, also there's a extensive grassland degradation due to overgrazing and uh, climate. So this situation actually happened now in China after 130 years later. During 1990s to uh, 2010, there are severe degradation of the grassland just because of the grazing and the climate change for the alpine grassland. So, but uh, when, I, when we visit the central plains, I don't see any severe degradation of the grassland. 
So the, the overgrazing probably is not a big issue in, in America, but it's really an issue in, in China. But from 2010, the Chinese government has initiated some ecological constru uh, construction and a project for the Qinghai Tibetan Plateau. So that's from this time on. Oh. This uh, this uh, ecological project just uh, you know just turn uh, this, this degraded the uh, ecosystem to start the uh, t to turn green the green for green. So today I, my talk will focus on the the challenges of open grassland. Second about the effect of climate change on biodiversity and the ecosystem functioning, and. It, Today we talk about uh, the green intensity on the biodiversity productivity and uh, also the biodiversity and the ecosystem multifunctionality. So it's, it, uh, it's uh, actually it's uh, similar as uh, Richard's uh, uh, talk, but more focus on the alpine grassland. Uh, actually, 20 years ago, 20 years ago, these are. Uh, uh, very nice su uh, pre summary. They published about climate change and the North American rangeland, the trends, projections, and uh, Im implications. And uh, they project that the warming and the drying will reduce soil water availability, NPP, and the other ecos ecosystem process in the southern Great Plains, but uh, will likely enhance. This process in the North Great Plains. Now, climate warming, climate change will affect the forage quantity, quality, livestock production, and it will uh, affect the provision of eco ecosystem service on the uh, North American rangeland system. This is a very comprehensive summary. For the Tibetan Plateau, in the past. Uh, in the past 50 years, the climate is just, uh, you know, it's warming, and this trend is very, you know, uh, uh, from the left figure, you see that it's, it's warming is uh, it's, uh, warming great. And uh, for the annual pre precipitation in the upper grassland, it, it's still, there's a little bit of increase, but not so much as the, as the warming. This warming is not just uh, for the certain place, it's for the whole plateau. From the left side, you see all, uh, one point that represents the uh, meteorological conditions. And uh, you see for the, all the temperature, the annual, mean annual temperature, they are increasing at a rate of 0.4 degrees per decade. For the right, it's the annual precipitation also increased, but with some, some uh, slight uh, decline for the precipitation, it's not uh, for the most of the area, it's uh, the precipitation is also increasing. For the, the, for the plateau, the human population, left one, the, 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 the picture is a population from the urban, rural, and total the population. This population are increasing. Now, actually, you know, for the China, our population, the, it seems stable, right, currently, and, and the growth rate is slightly decreased. But for the Tibetan, the local people, this, this is still increasing. In addition, for the local residents and the husbands, their income, are increasing. So, this increasing
Hey, 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 testing one, two. Yeah, no. Should we use this microphone? Doesn't work. That doesn't work, is it? Okay. works? No. It, it, it's, oh, hey, great. So th this, this change, just because of the, you know, their lifestyle, lifestyle changes. You know, before the, the for the local, local herdsmen, they live a simple life. But with the advance of the technology, the still pursuing the, the, the more comfortable lives. And the also the, for the products, just like the, like the beef and the mutton, they are also increasing sharply. They are increasing sharply. So, if they want to change their lives, they need more, they need more livestock. So that's, that's why there's overgrazing happens. So just, just because they need a, uh, living a more comfortable uh, uh, life. So they, so they need more livestock and uh, more livestock uh, cause the grassland decreasing. At the same time, the permafrost and uh, melting the, some grassland. This changes the grassland, the landscape, even even the, also the, there is carbon release from this, uh, s these soils. For the, for the, so for the climate change, this including the temperature, precip precipitation, e extreme events, and CO2 concentrations, this is not only the means, it's the variability and the seasonality. So all these ch affect the ecosystem from the Organisms, species, population, commu community, ecosystem, even the biomes, at a different uh, scale, at a time scale, from a second to seasonal years, decade, uh, and a century, and, uh, and more. And all this will affect the diversity, different uh, dimensions of diversity. For me, we just uh, conducted the experiment using experiment to test, to determine, to, to explore how this climate change will affect our pine grassland. This, this experiment we run already uh, over 10 years. We manipulated the, the temperature with control and warming to 1.82 degrees. And also precipitation, you use the rainfall shelter to change it minus 50% control to Increase fifty percent. This is also our uh, the flood is at the three thousand two hundred meters. It's alpine grassland. This we use the rainfall shelter. I use the infrared heater. You know, it's a bigger challenge if, if for us to do the experiment at the extreme environment. You would need the power. We need the, you know, everything to for the maintenance uh, for the right. One is we also measure the CO2 release. Just so we want to calculate how the climate change will affect the carbon sequestration. 
In addition to the climate change experiment, we, we also conducted a grazing experiment. So this is uh, our grazing experiment. We have two sites, and uh, with the grazing level, uh, it's light, moderate, and uh, heavy grazing. It was uh, all the factor of design with the two sides. So it, when we visited the Central Plains, we said uh, many ranches, the area is so large. But our experiment is not so large, but it's, it's still very neat for this kind of uh, experiment. At the same time, we measure the uh, greenhouse gas emissions from the it's alpine grassland, because it is, there is some grassland that is very wet. We call this this wetland, dominated by the uh, cobrasses, by the, also the, some sage, the carex, and uh, we measure the, this uh, inside the, 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 the greenhouse gas emission. So our objective is we want to find how climate change and human activities affect and biodiversity, community structure, and functioning in up and grassland ecosystem. We also want to find the, the how the multifunctionality and multiple ecosystem service for this up and grassland how they change with the climate warming and the, uh, and the human activities. So next. I was reported our some findings with our experiment and and, and, and the field uh, investigation. We use three approaches: use a manipulated experiment, and long-term monitoring, and large-scale this uh, transactor survey. So uh, we we can see this is the long-term biomass monitoring for the from the, our research station. This about from 32 years, oh sorry, from 32 years. There is further, you know, even there is a rapid climate warming, but the, the biomass, also we we'll call this NPP, above ground net primary productivity, there is no, no clear trend, but the plant community composition changed. And we, we, we can see the grass increasing, and for the sages decreasing, but uh, yeah, for the for the uh, forbs, it's no big change. In, ad in addition, for the long term uh, vegetarian changes, we observed that there's a change in the vegetarian growth. Uh, we 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 can see the start of the growth season start earlier. Also, the the growth end. End, end of the growth season also earlier, but the 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 ending. But the, but also the ending, uh, ending faster than the than, than the uh, uh, start of the growth season. As a result, so the 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 rapid growing period just uh, sh uh, uh, sh short. In, in, the, in addition, for the maximum growth rate, we, we observed the maximum growth rate has increased, but uh, the, the maximum growth period is shorter. That's a vegetation grew earlier and faster, but the growth period compressed. This is for the, for the, the, the alpine grassland, that is uh, the general pattern for this uh, uh, measurement. With our experiment, in the first five years, we observed the committed biomass warming didn't influence productivity, but the precipitation did. That's the uh, obvious, uh, obvious pattern. In addition, the, for the richness, species richness, both warming and uh, increased precipitation had a, a negative effect on the species richness. For the 10 years, you know, for the 10 years experiment, we, we, we find uh, the plant richness warming significantly, significantly reduced the plant biodiversity. It's from the richness and the Shannon index. Warming decreased the species rich, uh, richness. In addition, we also studied the microbial 
diversity. The, the general pattern is from, from two, two, uh, 2011 to 2020. That's about uh, 10 years. We observed that they, at the beginning, they, 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 even the control, there's changes. But, but the, the, the pattern is the warming drought and warming the drought decrease soil microbial diversity. And if also for the 10 years, we, we, we found for the productivity, above ground productivity, below ground productivity, and also the total MPP productivity. There's no bigger change. It seems that this species rich grassland is resistant to this climate change. Just they're kind of, they are resilient to this climate change. We also conducted the tri-sector survey on the uh, Tibetan plateau. From the we we we, we found uh, for the uh, ecosystem ecosystem stability. The stability is correlated to the uh, plant species, obscure mycorrhizae richness, and both it seems that both above and below ground biodiversity was positively related with the ecosystem productivity. So if we see the, the contribution, we find uh, the plant diversity contributed 39% and the soil biodiversity about 15%. The both above and the below ground biodiversity was positively associated with, with, with the species uh, stability. The below ground biodiversity not, not only affected the, the, the because the stability is also influenced through the indirect effect of the plant diversity. That's the, the, the result. We, we also, uh, this, this kind of patterns is consistent with the, there's one experiment in the Oklahoma. It's from a Jew, Jew, Jew's lab. It's from Oklahoma. They study the, the, uh, they study the bacteria, fungi, pro, and the protist, they also observed that the warming effects was negative on bacteria, fungi, and the protist uh, diversity. This is uh, 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 just published in the last year, Nature Microbiology. So next I'll talk about the green intensities. The so grazing is a common practice on the on the uh, Tibetan plateau, and the, the herds, the local people, depends for this survival. This, this wild, wild yak. It's very similar to the American bison, American buffalo. You see, it's all very powerful. But for the American buffalo, they have never been domesticated or ne never been tempted by the by the American Indians. But a wild yak, but now you can see the yak grazing. It's a common practice, and the, the Tibetan people, they rely on these animals for survival. There are more than 14 million domestic yaks are currently herded on the plateau. And it, this estimated this domestication of yak probably took place between 8,000 to 10,000 years ago as an increment with the early settlement of the human beings on the, on the Tibetan plateau. It's, it's very interesting to, to compare. It's natural for me to compare the wild yak and, and the American bison. They play a central role in the local native peoples. For the, for the grazing, the classically, there is, there is several theories or, or hypotheses. There is an intermediate this turbulence hypothesis actually is up, it states that the local species diversity should be the highest at the intermi intermediate levels of disturbance. Just from the, the, the figures, the, the, the uh, intermediate uh, grazing intensity will increase this, uh, this uh, diversity. However, this increased issue is cancer. Intermediate disturbance hypothesis being applied to functional phylogeny, uh, 
phylogenetic diversity along the, this gradient. Uh, gradient. So it's predict the species diversity as the uh, will follow the intermediate disturbance hypothesis for the fecundity diversity. We just don't know for the uh, f functional trace variability that may be changed. We just don't know. So we find the intermediate disturbance hypothesis can be extended to functional diversity, but cannot not extended to the phylogenetic diversity. It is, you know, we 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 studied the five five years. We also found the same the pattern. The species diversity will change with the gradient intensity, gradient, uh, and the functional diversity also highest at the intermediate disturbance. But uh, for the phylogenetic diversity, they doesn't follow this pattern. In addition to the plant species, we also measured the, the herbivore diversity using malus traps and uh, Berkeley's tall green funnel for the, for the nematodes, something like that. And also we used the pitfall traps. And we just uh, conducted this experiment. We collected many these samples. And we we find the the gradient intensity, the the anthropod diversity, also consistent with the intermediate disturbance hypothesis. They also higher in the medium uh, gradient intensity. For, but the, the mechanism for this this effect is because the gradient gradient livestock they not only affect the 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 physically affect the soil. Property, they also affect the soil property through the livestock excrete, just like a pool, something pool, and also this affected the the plant diversity by the interaction of herbivore and the plants. We conducted a meta analysis to see how the the, the gradients on the plateau affect the. The, the above ground and the below ground biodiversity. Actually, there are several studies, se uh, several studies already we conducted. We will find for the above ground uh, biodiversity, the, the warming, l light warming, moderate warming, and the heavy grazing, all these, oh, sorry, the light grazing, moderate grazing, and heavy grazing, they affect the evenness and Moderate grazing increased the the above ground diversity, but for the below ground diversity, it seems there's not much uh, changes with the with the with the grazing. So the 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 matter of warming and grazing and plant diversity was greater than that on the soil microbial diversity. Uh, sorry. I, as for the uh, grazing, there's also there's a, on the grazing on the productivity, there's a grazing optimum uh, optimization hypothesis. That states the, 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 the uh, moderate level of grazing may increase the background net primary productivity because the grazing may stimulate the, the plant. Uh, Growth, the, the the mechanism is the grazing will release of apical dominance, so they will st stimulate it, and, and, and also there's other factors associated with this kind of uh, it's uh, the grazing activities. So we uh, according to our experiment, we find uh, above ground MPP and below ground MPP, they are. As we see, and uh, for the these are uh, comp uh, over composition. We calculate the uh, composition index. We just find the above ground MPP. They f follow this kind of the the uh, over, over there's over composition, but there's no over composition for the below ground. So there's uh, the the over composition for the above ground uh, at the cost of the below ground. I assume that the, this is. But for the, the for the total MPP, there is no bigger 
uh, it's follow the above ground uh, general above ground the MPP, but it's not no, much uh, response. We we also found the gradient uh, experiment worldwide. There's actually the, in the last five years there's not much gradient. The only twenty seven uh, publications uh, worldwide. So because the grid has important impact on grassland ecosystem, but uh, the related theory were developed more than forty years ago. But I think now it's time to re revisit. Well, in addition, we we'll coordinate the global grid network covering different eco-regions eco with the uniform protocol is, is, is needed if, if, if we can get some general uh, patterns. So we already have a one grid experiment network across China. We have 12 sites. Well, we, we, we try to use the, the same protocol, follow the same protocol. We will see how the grazing affected the, the ecosystem from from the east to the to the to the to the west of the uh, along a gradient of precipitation. So next, I will talk about uh, the grassland uh, multifunctionality. Uh, that's uh, for the implications for the close to nature restoration. For for the grassland, if, if there is a tract of grassland uh, for the for the for the local farmers, they will see the forage the production. But for the con 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 uh, conversation, this you call it, they see the biodiversity. There's some very high biodiversity. Some of the low biodiversity. The for the EPA. Environment Protection Agency, they care about the water conservation, soil retention, something like that. And also for the climate mitigation, they care about the, how the carbon sequestration. So the ecosystem multifunctionality for the grassland is just the ability of ecosystem to perform multiple functions simultaneously. So this uh, multifunctionality index just uh, uh, combine all these functions t together. So for the for the the multifunctionality biodiversity grassland multifunctionality this is studies and actually this is pretty new in the 2007 that's uh, the Andy Hector and his colleagues just developed the a method. First article to quantify ecosystem multifunctionality. Then there's some important papers published on how species richness and soil biodiversity and soil composition. They will affect the the multifunction multifunctionality. And in the two, two, 2017, <laughs> there's a paper published the, in the Nature Ecology. And uh, evolution, they found that there's some there's some problem with the ecosystem multifunctioning the the the, um, the quantify method quantify method, and uh, in 2018, the mining they they, they define ecosystem multifunctionality. There's, there's also uh, uh, so we find that uh, 2020 we. we uh, we, we developed a standard uh, ecosystem multifunctionality method. So, so there's, there's a, we find why there's an uh, artifact in the calculation. And you introduce uh, this concept of the ecosystem multi serviceability. So, for the new framework, I think you know, personally, the ecosystem multifunctionality, just like this framework, we, there's, there's an ecosystem of function. Usually, we, we measure this function is about the stocks and the, and the fluxes. So we just kind of measure the indicator for these fluxes and the stocks. And the ecosystem service. And also in the scope of ecosystem multifunctionality. So that's the ecosystem service. But we think ecosystem service is service serving 
be served. Actually, it's different because there's ecosystem. If there's no, uh, just uh, probably they kind of deliver, uh, deliver a service. If there's there's no people living there, there's no care about this kind of process. So we think that we need to distinguish the ecosystem multifunctionality with uh, the ecosystem multi-service. But this, you know, service it depends on the stakeholders. You know, for the farmers, their service is different. For the for the scientists, their service is different. For the uh, uh, for the environmental protection agency, the, this service is different. So. That's a new framework. I would think we should distinguish between the ecosystem multifunctionality and ecosystem multi serviceability. And uh, this will be make it easier and uh, uh, logically to t distinguish, and uh, we can different recognition and uh, by different stakeholders. We can, you know, we can assess different different stakeholders. They may be uh, have a different uh, multifunctionality. So the. This is the frame, new framework. The ecosystem multifunctionality. This uh, 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 care about the, the the stocks or materials, the rates or process. For the ecosystem multi uh, serviceability, there's a benefit that human uh, human obtain from the nature. This is just like for the ecosystem multifunction, it's just like a liquid decomposition, nutrient cycling, plant species, diversity, primary production. But for the service, just like this kind of climate regulation, water conservation, biodiversity conservation, and the forage production, this this kind of the ecosystem ecosystem deliver their their, their service for the human beings. Actually, we we also studied. Uh, this kind of ecosystem multifunctionality. Along the Tibetan plateau, we conducted the we surveyed this uh, the uh, the do the transect and uh, and uh, measure soil bacteria, soil fung fungal, soil archaea, and uh, this uh, uh, obscure mycorrhiza. This 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 all this uh, kind of measurement of the diversity. We also found the soil uh, the plant species richness. This. Uh, all the, the multifunctionalities are, are positively linked to the most of this, uh, this, uh, this, this taxonomic groups, but uh, is not linked to the soil archaea diversity. So this, uh, and uh, this kind of study, we, we, we just found a mean annual precipitation, I mean annual temperature that directly affect the ecosystem multifunctionality in addition. They also affect the plant diversity, soil biodiversity. They all contributed to the change of ecosystem multifunctionality. And the climate and the climate change will affect this ecosystem multifunctionality. With our experiment, actually, we also study the, the whole the, the climate change affected the multifunctionality using our experiment. Lesson. After a decade of warming experiment, we find the the warming decreased ecosystem multifunctionality. Uh, even uh, the, for the for the for the farmers, for the for the biodiversity conservation agency, and for the yeah, all we arrive at a similar conclusions. The warming. We will have negative effect on the ecosystem multifunctionality. So biodiversity is crucial to the maintenance of and uh, maintain and stabilize maintain stabilize the community productivity. But the decorate the ecosystem should be restored in a project close to nature. Learn from nature to restore biodiversity, such as achieve full recovery of ecosystem function. So this just uh, there's there's some restoration project, ongoing, ongoing project. It's just like this kind of project in the, at the four thousand meters, and this is the restored grassland. Restored that is just uh, you know dominated by the monoculture or a few species, 
actually this this kind of grassland should be like this this original all the grass grassland should be like this a species rich grassland so we just propose a close to nature restoration of this this kind of uh, uh, grassland make, making natural back to nature and even better than the nature with the adapted uh, uh, adapted uh, uh, new species, and uh, but uh, if if we do this this approach, we need uh, some uh, species choice seed production, species mixture, enhanced diversity, and uh, ecological restoration. This all this process we need, and it's 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 not an easy task. It's 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 also a challenge, especially for the plant choice and the seed production, and the seed mixture, what kind of seed mixture, what kind of uh, composition is, is matters for this kind of uh, restoration. In addition, I shall, actually, Richard um, just talked about uh, the whole soil microbial uh, effect, the ecosystem functioning. Actually, there is a soil microbial choice as, as well, the plant choice and also soil microbial choice. So, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, there's a uh, soil ecological engineering for grassland sustainability. And so for the bio, uh, diversity friendly grassland landscape in Asia, it's also it's important for the semi natural habitat as a small fields and in increase the natural, uh, increase the natural uh, se uh, se separation zones. So just like see the rain and see the bank. To inside the large tract of uh, tract of the this this grassland, it's also grassland as a reference for this kind of restoration. Okay. So the for the conclusions, the, I, I think uh, climate change and human activity are major challenges for the grassland, but uh, ecosystem have different uh, priorities. And the climate change has greater impact on biodiversity than productivity. It seems that species rich productivity has they get resilient. And the greater impact on our ground diversity than on below ground diversity. This uh, is from our experiment, but it's not uh, long enough. And also study on grazing land needed to be carried out in a framework that uh, incorporates the functional trees, uh, tree, uh, trees, plant and animal interaction and evolution. So the value of grassland experiment lies in their multifunctionality. And, uh, Close to nature, restoration is the key to restore the multifunctionality. With that, I, you know, I need to thank uh, my colleagues and uh, Professor Zhi Nan and Jing Yunfang, uh, the several of these, uh, our, our colleagues. Uh, for the funding agency, it's the Natural Science Foundation of China and the Minister of, of Science and Technology of China. Uh, yeah. Sorry for the, uh, I, here I, I, I bring you know, this, uh, a new journal. Grassland Research is sponsored by Chinese Grassland Society and also Lando University. This, this journal is just a, a, a journal of forage, rangeland, and ecology. So we, we have a strong uh, editorial uh, team with Zhi uh, Nan as the chief editor, co-chief editor, including Charlie Brumer and also Zheng Yu Wang, uh, uh, no, yeah, Charlie Brumer, Bernhard Schmid, and also there's uh, one uh, back Gary, and uh, uh, associate editor chief about Zheng Yu and myself, and also Ying Jun. And we have uh, a uh, four time uh, managing editor, that's Kerry Matthew. That's, uh, with that, that's, uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you.